Hello, and welcome to today's conversation called Hidden No More, the life and legacy of Mary W. Jackson. We'll be learning about this incredible trailblazer from a great group of guests. With us today is the author of Hidden Figures, Margot Lee Shetterly, NASA Chief Historian, Bill Berry, and NASA Administrator, Jim Bridenstine. I'm Bettina Klan with NASA's Office of Communications. On June 24th, NASA Administrator Bridenstine announced that the agency's headquarters building in Washington, D.C. would be named after Mary W. Jackson, NASA's first black female engineer. Today, we'll learn more about this incredible woman, her career, her NASA legacy, and what she really means to the agency as we move forward. Throughout the conversation, we'll also be taking questions submitted by NASA employees. Let's begin. We'll start with NASA Administrator Jim Bredenstein. Well, thank you so much, Bettina, and what an honor to be here um, to celebrate, really, the life of Mary W. Jackson and all of her achievements. Um, yes, we are, we are going to name the headquarters building, which until now has not had a name, but we're going to name it after Mary W. Jackson, and there, there are so many reasons um, why this is the case. Uh, she was a leader at the agency. In fact, even before NASA was an agency, it was the NACA, um, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. And of course, Mary W. Jackson was a mathematician and a computer. Back then, we didn't have big machines. What we had were people and mathematicians that did the computing that today we would have machines do. And, and Mary W. Jackson had to overcome adversity in order to achieve all of her monumental achievements. But to start with, um, she had to work in a segregated environment with so many other human computers at the time. And yet there were people at NASA who recognized her intellect and her capabilities. And there were people at NASA who said, wait a second, uh, maybe you need to be more than a human computer. You should be an engineer. And she accepted that challenge. And not only did she accept the challenge, she then had to overcome more adversity because at the time education was segregated in Virginia. And so she had to go to a school um, that was segregated and, and, and it was whites only. And she had to encourage everybody to allow her into the classroom. And she got accepted into the classroom, overcame adversity and became an engineer. Um, and as you said, Bettina, she was the first African-American female engineer at the agency. But of course, when we decided that we were gonna name the headquarters building after Mary W. Jackson, we also wanted to talk to her daughter and her granddaughter and, um, and her relatives and hear what they had to say. And, and what they said matched perfectly what I've read, um, what Margot Shetterly has written of, um, the things that you see in the movie Hidden Figures, what they said is that they taught her, um, her, her daughter and her granddaughter, Mary W. Jackson taught them that whenever you overcome adversity, whenever you achieve, whenever you move up, always, always, always bring people with you. And that's who Mary W. Jackson was. She was somebody who brought people with her. It wasn't just about her climbing the ranks. In fact, she gave up opportunity for promotion because she was more interested in equal opportunity. She was more interested in diversity. And of course, she became the head of our equal opportunity and diversity office at the time there at the Langley Research Center. Um, but her contributions are you know, civil rights. Her contributions are um, inclusion and diversity. But beyond that, her contributions were enabling America to achieve more than it ever could have achieved in spaceflight. And for all those reasons, it made great sense to name the headquarters building after Mary W. Jackson. And of course, if you just look her up online, you can see all of her achievements, all of her awards, all of her prizes. Um, but I think the prize that um, is above all others is in 2019, Congress, the House and the Senate voted unanimously to give her a Congressional Gold Medal, and that was signed into law by the President of the United States. Um, and I think it's a, a perfect example of how the United States of America um, really needs to overcome a lot of the history 
um, and get us to a new spot where everybody is recognized and everybody is in fact included. Bettina, thank you for putting this together and I'm very excited about listening to a dialogue uh, b between Margot Shetterly, of course, who wrote the book Hidden Fig Figures and you know now the movie that we've all seen and Bill Barry, the NASA historian who of course um, has been at the agency for years and knows more about NASA than I'll, I'll ever know. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to this dialogue about why it is we decided to name the NASA headquarters building after Mary W. Jackson. So Bettina, thanks for having me and I'll turn it back over to you. So thank you so much, Administrator. We're now going to invite Bill Barry and Margo to turn on their cameras so we can start this conversation. Hi, Bettina. Hi, Margo. Hey, Bill. Hi, Bettina. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today for this conversation, Hidden No More, about the life and legacy of Mary W. Jackson. We just heard from the administrator. He talked a lot about, about her life, and we wanted to dive into it. There's a lot of people who haven't read the book, and we had some questions. Margo, you're the author of this incredible book, um, but that, as the administrator mentioned, became a popular movie. But what drew you to write these stories about NASA women? How did you get started on this research? Uh, well, it's very interesting. I mean, I am, I consider myself to be a product of NASA and its history because my father, who's now retired, um, was an atmospheric research scientist at NASA Langley in Hampton, Virginia, where I grew up. So I, you know, I knew Mary Jackson, I knew Katherine Johnson, I knew many of the engineers and the scientists that worked with them all the NASA people, um, because they were part of my community and they were part of my father's work. Um, so NASA has been a part of my life as long as I can remember. Um, and uh, when I started working on this book in 2010, it was, the, it was an opportunity for me to look at the history behind those people and to really understand in a way I never had prior to that point, uh, the contributions that they had made to science and engineering and to NASA and its predecessor, um, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. So um, I, I guess you could say that I was, you know, eventually this, this might have been my destiny to write this book, given my background. And with a book, we have this new term, hidden figures. Where did, where did that come from? Uh, so the, the title Hidden Figures, you know, when you're, I think when you're writing a book or uh, trying to come up with even a research report or any kind of uh, creative endeavor, coming up with a title that sums it up is often the hardest part. And there were many titles that I had, working titles, as I was going through the process of, of working and researching this book. Um, hidden figures, you know, honestly, it was one of these things that just popped into mind. I mean, really like wholly formed at one point. Um, but the thing about the title is that it really, uh, it has, it has layers of meaning, you know, it really represented the fact that the women were hidden away in their own separate office. Uh, the fact that the figures, the numbers, you know, we see the result, but we we don't often see the numbers that go into it. Um, and so not just those women, but the entire work of the engineers and that whole team behind these spectacular technological advancement, all of that work was also hidden. You know, so there were all these layers of meaning that once that title came to the fore, you know, I thought, wow, that's everything that I wanted to say about this in two words. Bill, maybe, you, and, and that is fantastic. Maybe, we'll, Bill, you can give us some more context on um, these hidden figures. We're talking about the women of West computing. Why were they called human computers? You know, who were these women and how did this come to be? Uh, well, this all traces back to the uh, early part of the 20th century. The NACA engineers got tired of doing all the math all the time. <laughs> and they and they said we need some help here to, to reduce all the data from these wind tunnel tests and, and those sorts of things. So um, the NACA tried an experiment in mid 30s, you know, to bring women in to do the, the sort of the grunt computing work. Um, and as it turns out, the experiment was a huge success. There were, um, you know, we have actually have a letter from uh, the NACA 
uh, where they responded to a request from industry about how did women computers, you know, how this experiment with yours work out? And they, they wrote back and said, you know, not only are the women, you know, they're faster, they're more accurate, they get more done in the morning than the engineers could get done in the whole day. And, and we don't have to pay them as much, right? Because you know, they're women and everything was women's work. Uh, so computing became women's work, uh, sort of uh, um, sub engineering specialty that uh, that was able to be done. And the NAC relied on women in, in the 30s and into the 40s during the war, uh, World War II. Uh, and the NAC, like everybody else, was short staffed because so many of the you know people were off at war itself. Um, and uh, in desperation to find more uh, mathematicians to do the work, then the calculating work for them. Um, they actually started tapping the African American community and they, they had a, a great pool of folks out there, you know, people who were um, didn't have an opportunity to, to to exercise the skills that they had in in a larger context, other than largely in the African American segregated school system. Uh, but once the NACA touched into that that uh, tap there, they found a, an incredibly talented pool and, and brought in a bunch of them. So um, but of course it's Hampton, Virginia, 1940s, everything's still segregated. In fact, it's not just segregated because that's the way it is, it's segregated because that's the law in Virginia. Um, so um, you wind up with this separate uh, computing unit there and you have the you know the white woman computers. Uh, and then um, because of where the facility was built, where they were, they, they were expanding the Langley facility and they built a unit out to the west of the, the main campus, uh, which is now what's now Langley Research Center. Um, but the West Computing Unit was named that because that just happened to be the location where they were. I think I got all that right, Margaret. Absolutely. Check, 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 check. So, Bill, yeah, it's really great that you say that. And as you were talking about the, the buildings, I actually can visualize in my mind the floor plans. You know, one of the things that was so great for me doing the research for this book was all of the incredible research and all of the artifacts that, that you guys had saved and had scanned and that I found in the NASA history office and headquarters and that Mary Gaynor um, had had in the, the Langley Research Center. Um, so it's so funny as you're, you're recounting the history, I'm actually going through my mind and seeing all of the, the raw documents that, that made up this story. Fantastic. That's funny. I became chief historian about the time you started working on the book, and and I remember wandering into the archive from time to time and seeing seeing you at work there and thinking, I wonder what she's doing. <laughs> and little did little I know that how important your work would be in uh, in the years to come. Yeah. yeah, incredibly important. We now have multiple facilities named after um, our, these hidden figures that you wrote about in your book, and as the administrator mentioned, we said in the opening um, statements. NASA headquarters is now called Mary W. Jackson. But can you tell us more who was Mary W. Jackson? So Mary Jackson, you know, I think it's, it is so fitting that this building is named after Mary Jackson. Um, Mary, uh, her family, the Winston family of the W of her name, um, they were from Hampton, Virginia. Uh, her father and her mother actually met when they were college students in the late 1890s in Hampton, in uh, Hampton, what was then called Hampton Institute. Um, Mary and her siblings all went to Hampton University, so she really was a part of this community, like a very fundamental part of this um, this community that that grew up in the shadow of, of the Civil War and then Reconstruction. Um, so Mary worked at the uh, the USO, the United Service Organization, you know, uh, during World War II. She was a teacher. And then she came to uh, to NASA after a very short stint at Fort Monroe as a secretary, another military institution in Hampton. Um, but Mary had been very good at math and science. Um, you know, this was um, that was her her field of study when she was in college, and she came in as a computer. She was working for Dorothy Vaughn in the then segregated West Area Computing Unit. Um, and then she rotated into um, a work group called the four foot by four foot supersonic pressure tunnel. This was one of the wind tunnels, um, which was sort of the bread and butter of the work at the at a part of the work anyway, at the uh, the Langley Laboratory, it was then called. And um, moving into that group really kicked off her career. And she worked for uh, a senior engineer, a guy named Casimir Sarnicki. Um, who, uh, you know, and we've seen the dramatization in the movie, 
Uh, and you know the movie always changes a little bit, but the core of that story is absolutely true. Um, Casimir's in in real life uh, saw her engineering talent and said, "Listen, staying in the computing pool is fine, but I think you'd make a great engineer." And um, that proved to be absolutely true. The two of them, uh, he was sort of first her mentor, and then they became research partners, and they did quite a few uh, re authored quite a few research reports over the years principally on um, aircraft, supersonic aircraft, um, that they would you know, look at the protrusion of rivets and how did that change the efficiency of the aircraft as it was flying, things like that. Um, so Mary was an engineer, and as we know, NASA is an engineering organization, so she was a real fit for that. Um, and then, as, as you mentioned, Mary, at the end of her career, as the administrator mentioned, um, took a, a demotion in order to go into, um, into human resources and really remove barriers for other women of all backgrounds. She was really, really committed to making sure that all people had a chance, an equal chance at moving up. So, um, you know, and that, that's, that is, I think, a real testament to the person that she was, that uh, she was a humanitarian. She was always somebody who was trying to gather different kinds of people around her and get the talents of all of those people together in order to advance what she thought was, was her mission, part of which was NASA's mission, science and engineering, and part of which was a, a larger humanitarian mission. And I think that she was a true humanitarian spirit. That is fantastic. So uh, a lot of us know this story because of the movie. movie. In the movie, Hidden Figures, Janelle Monet plays Mary W. Jackson. And how the movie was written, was that an accurate portrayal of Mary? You've already pointed one little change. You know, we know these movies are entertaining. They're not exactly documentaries. But I'd love to hear, you know, Mar uh, Margot, from you, like, where you thought it was accurate. And Bill, if you can tell us, like, what is NASA's role in making sure that these are historically supported movies? All right. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and start, Margot? Uh, well, you know, uh, Bill and I, <laughs> we we met because, you know, through this process of this movie coming together. And um, so I will have, you know, we've lots of short stories and great memories about that. But, you know, it was very interesting to see this process of having the uh, the book become a film. And I would say that although there were things facts that were changed, you know, the timelines were, were different, the, um, you know, some of the things about the characters and the names were changed. But the thing that I, I really felt, and I believe this was true for the, for, you know, for NASA and for the families, is that the movie was true, you know, and I think there's, there's a slight difference between truth and fact and story, but there was, there was so much truth and um, understanding of the conditions that the women were working in the situation, the geopolitical situation at the time, um, the character of each of the individual women. Um, and, and that, I was really impressed at how the filmmakers were very committed to making sure that the truth of that came through. So that even as you, you know, you kind of look at the apple and of the book and the orange of the film, and you say, well, that's an apple and that's an orange. Um, that when you when you take both of them together, you still did get the truth of, of those women and that story. Um, and, you know, and Bill, I mean, Bill, just, you know, you did so much like detailed, detailed research for that movie. Well, I, I think we shared the duty with a lot of folks at NASA because the, the, the production team, particularly the director, uh, Ted Melfi, was he was completely fanatical about trying to get, you know, tell the true story. Uh, uh, and also tell an entertaining story that would, you know, make a powerful movie, which which he did a great job with. Um, but uh, also to get as many of the details exactly correct as he could. And you know, some of the things, uh, you know, get altered, like uh, you know, Kaz, you know, Zarnicki's name uh, in, in his hometown. He wasn't from Europe. He actually grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, for example. But you know, little things like that. But but you know the fundamental things I think as Margot pointed out are, are are the key. You know it's it it may be that it's an apple and an orange sort of thing, but uh, the orange of the movie tastes a lot like that an apple. I think I mean it really tells you something true about about what happened at the time. 
Um, but yeah, there are uh, there are a lot of things, um, a lot, and a lot of people at NASA who helped out the photo lab, the video archive, uh, the folks in procurement who helped actually. One of the the things in the back drop of the scene, uh, there's a, a a painting of airplanes that was actually at Langley Research Center and was being accessed. And and the, the procurement office there actually we actually managed to inter, intercept that on its way out the door and have them loan it to the movie studio so they could put it in the background. It appears as a sort of toss away thing in the background of a couple of scenes, but uh, but it was something that actually would have been in the background uh, during um, things that happened at Langley Research Center at the time. So so they were really fanatical about about doing that stuff. But yeah, they wanted to tell a good story too. Um, so, for example, there's this the scene where Mary Jackson uh, gets her, she's walking through the wind tunnel and she gets her, her high heel caught in the, the grate on the floor, right? And I argued like crazy with Ted Melfi about that. It's, it's Ted, you know, first of all, nobody walks to their office through a wind tunnel, right? That's not a corridor, right? And even if you were, nobody in their right mind be wearing high heels because it's, we don't, just don't do that sort of stuff. You know, anybody who knows anything about wind tunnels is going to know that's not really going to happen. And Ted paused for a second and he goes, yeah, he goes, but how many people know anything about wind tunnels besides you people at work at NASA? And I said, well, he goes, I'm telling you, this is going to make a great scene. People will remember that scene. And guess what? We all remember that scene, right? Uh, so he was right. They did a great job telling a good story, but also getting at the fundamental truth of, of what things were. And, and, and I think they did a particularly nice job with, with Mary W. Jackson in, in terms of um, getting to her, you know, her real character and showing, you know, both the grit of her personality and uh, her stick to uh, but also, um, you know, the humanitarian side and, and, you know, how she, you know, cared for her family and, and, uh, and juggled all those things and managed to um, make things better for all of us. Um, one of the questions we got from employees is when researching for your book, did you come across any other African-American hidden figures, women or men worth noting? Yeah, you know, one of the, the real challenges, particularly in the beginning of the book, is that there were so many interesting people uh, that it was it was a real challenge not to want to tell every single everyone's story. Um, and, you know, they were figuring out how all of these people had come to NASA and the work that they did, particularly during that golden age of um, of the Mercury missions and Gemini and Apollo. Uh, it was really hard to to sort of pare it down, but there were so many people. Um, there was Jim Williams, who was an African American engineer, um, one of the the early uh, black men who had been hired at the Langley Research Center. Um, there was Dorothy Hoover, very very interesting black woman, um, who had also come in 1943 during this this push during World War II, um, had become was promoted to a research scientist. So her title was actually research scientist. She, she really did move up um, out of the computing pool and was in this very interesting um, uh, theoretical kind of um, you know very mathematical theoretically mathematically oriented group. Um, and then left, went back, started doing some graduate study. Um, and eventually ended up at Goddard Research Center. So she was a, a really fascinating person. Um, and then, you know, I would just say, scoping back from that beyond simply, you know, the African American people in the story, there were so many women and men from all backgrounds. And, you know, what I didn't know was how many people had come from abroad, international people who were working there at the, the Langley Research Center, people who had come from, Germany and Poland and Asia. Um, you know, there were people who had come from all over the United States who were converging on what was a war boom town at the time, World War II. Um, you know, and, and I think that, you know, again, this, this sort of the metaphor of, or, you know, the, the concept of hidden figures and really understanding and looking and seeing how each of these people whose names I, I, you know, some of their names I had known, others I didn't. Um, certainly the details of their work, I really didn't know until I started doing this. And to see how all of these different people came together, you know, very different circumstances, bringing them together to this one place and um, coming together to achieve this mission over time, you know, that, that culminated in something like the moon landing in 1969 and seeing all of the people and the talent required to get there and to having the privilege of seeing all of that from the 
sort of behind the scenes and knowing um, their names at this point and knowing what they contributed to, to science and to our history. There are so well, many great stories about uh, people that, that worked at NASA in the past that's, uh, you know, I, I wish we had a thousand historians to tell all these stories, but, uh, you know, fortunately we've got, you know, some great ones like uh, Margo here who, who've been able to unearth these things and, and tell these stories for us. It's been, it's a real privilege to have, uh, have you apply that kind of talent to, to the this story for us. I, I'm just so appreciative. Yeah, well, it, it's a quirky group of people. You know, I knew that growing up. And, um, you know, when you when you start looking back into the history and you hear the stories about, um, you know, the one chief uh, engineer in charge who was there briefly, who uh, tried to kind of create a system where he could drive his car and read a book at the same time, you know, <laughs> That, that you, you see that and you're like, you understand a little bit about the DNA of the organization. Well, I really enjoyed reading your book. Um, and it, it, especially as a NASA employee, I became even more proud of our history um, of and how much we have accomplished as a team, as an agency. And um, one of the questions that we got was, was there anything that you found in your research that you did not portray in the movie or the book and what came to mind, and I'm, I'm sure you have a lot, was when we were, I was reading your book in the epilogue, um, you talk about the second part of Mary W. Jackson's life mm -hmm. and that you wish you could have talked more about that. Can you tell us more? Because I think it's, in, especially as we've named this building in her honor, that plays a big part in her, the bigger part of her legacy. Absolutely true. Um, and, and I think, you know, it is, it is, it makes so much sense given Mary's long career at NASA and the fact that she spanned um, the, the time at the laboratory when it was part of the NACA. She was there for NASA in the golden years, the, the entire push through Apollo. And then she had this very kind of institutional administrative affiliation with the agency at the, the administrative level, the federal level and really um, trying to uh, get the most out of the assets. You know, the assets in, in a knowledge-based company that we, we know today, right, this is what drives our economy, are the people. You need talented people. You need to liberate them to do the best work. Um, you need to uh, figure out ways for them to work together. And that was something that Mary Jackson, in addition to being a gifted engineer, really had that understanding of organizational dynamics and, and people. And so that section, the epilogue in the book, uh, discussing this decision that she made at the end of her career after uh, Kazimierz Sarnicki retired, and he really was this, this fundamental research partner for many years, she then made the decision to go into human resources, to take a step back, to go from a GS-12 to a GS-11 in order to take this job, even as she had worked very hard to get promoted uh, as an engineer over the course of those years. She made that decision and then she really uh, became a part of the institutional structure and the institutional memory, not just the engineering part, but the institutional part of, of NASA. Um, and she was, in, in during that time, the federal women's program manager. Her job really was to take a look at the, the career prospects for women in the, the, the organization at the time and do what she could with her team to remove barriers so that people like, for example, Dr. Christine Darden, um, who became um, very, very well-known uh, supersonic aeronautical engineer, um, so that she could do her best work. So um, at one point when I was writing the book, I really did have this idea that I would continue it all the way through to like, you know, 1980 and 1983. So we could actually see the result, which was Christine Darden, you know, kind of uh, as a complete expression of, of these early women. Um, but, but you know, you, you, you kind of have to consider people's attention spans when you write a book as well. And I made it an epilogue, but that part of Mary W. Jackson's life um, I think is is an important one. And so just because it's not shown in detail in the book the way the earlier part is, doesn't mean that I think it is any less important. And it, it really does speak to her character and to her commitment to this 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 uh, this institution that she truly loved. 
Uh, Bill, do you have anything to add? I know that she even spent some time at headquarters doing some training um, for this. Yeah, she she uh, of course came to headquarters for training because you know she's shifting from being an engineer to being a uh, you know HR person. Um, and while some engineers might think, well, that's easy, you know, <laughs> it, uh, you know, everybody has their specialty, and, and you can't just you know take off one hat one day and put on the other one the next day. Well, you can. And some people do it better than others, maybe. But but she came to headquarters and get get some training in the HR thing, and, and then did this. Um, one of the the things you know, context wise, to think about it, it's. Kind of hard to imagine maybe now um, in in you know 2020, but uh, you know back in the, in the 70s, uh, the women's movement had been at work there, and and that was a really important uh, issue. And and you know people like Mary Jackson were were breaking glass ceilings, but they kept running into more ceilings above. Um, and so um, that was a, a critical time for NASA to to face the music on this the issue of you know women's rights. Uh, and and we didn't do a very good job of it in the '60s. Um, you know, we got better over time. But um, you know, one of the, the things to me about uh, about Mary's decision to do that is that it was a it was a critical thing that helped the agency, you know, embody the culture that we all aspire to in in new ways that you know to face the new environment. Uh, and that was an environment where you know we really needed to be inclusive of women uh, who's. You know, 50 percent of the human population that we're basically ignoring uh, their talents, except in exceptional cases, maybe. Uh, but we needed to, to make it possible for that to happen. And, and so, you know, her her commitment to that, uh, I think, is both a, a sign of her commitment to you know humanity in general, but also specifically to the you know to NASA and and uh, and our future. Uh, and so that's that's one of the reasons I really love the fact that we named the building after her. One of the things that we got is like, what advice do you think Mary W. Jackson would give to current and future NASA leaders if she was still living today? That's a good question. Margo, you want to take a shot at that? Uh, that is a good question because I think she was somebody who had a lot of good advice. Um, you know, the, the thing that I would say is, uh, Mary Jackson, so, you know, I will just say that I grew up in this community of NASA people where there were a lot of engineers and scientists and people really did have that spirit from, you know, the 60s and 70s and I guess kind of on into the 80s. Um, I don't know if you want to call it like the kind of the Star Trek spirit, you know, this like sense of adventure of science being so important, um, of science and humanity being, you know, two parts of the same thing, you know, this exploring spirit to boldly go where no man has gone before and, and for the benefit of humanity, you know? So I really grew up in that kind of an environment. And Mary Jackson had that, you know, my father has that. All of these, you know, Christine Darden, they really had that, it was a part of who they were. And so from the time we were little kids, these NASA people were, always trying to convince us that the very best thing that we could do with our talents was to become a scientist or to become an engineer. And, um, you know, I, you know, my dad didn't get an engineer out of me, but I do have, you know, one of my sisters, a, a, a cancer researcher. So he did get one scientist out of the lot. But, um, you know, I think that, that having the, the current generation of NASA people reach down to these kids today and say, this is amazing work. It's exciting work. It is cool work. Um, you know, and because we're always talking about the 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 STEM workforce of the, the present and of the future and where is the talent going to come from? Well, if you're looking at kids in college, it, it's kind of too late, I think. You know, like you really have to start cultivating that talent uh, when they're very young. And And one of the real gifts of my childhood is that you know, we got exposure to that, to science, to um, the wonder of it, not just the technical part of it, but the wonder of it, very, very young. And so I think Mary Jackson, who was always, you know, creating after school programs for kids and having them build wind tunnels, you know, things like that, it, it's amazing. It really has an impact. And I think you know, we got a lot of engineers and scientists out of that generation because of people like Mary Jackson. So I would say that uh, one of her bits of advice would be to follow in her footsteps and evangelize for science and technology and engineering, because that is also part of being a humanitarian. 
That is fantastic. And as we talk more about Mary W. Jackson's legacy, I'd like to invite the administrator to join us back into the conversation. Jim? <laughs> Hi. You know, um, so, you know, Margo, in that last question, you answered our one of the questions. It's, it's very similar. We actually got a question from a, a fifth grader at Charles Barry Elementary School who um, I know that, you know, Children were very important to Mary W. Jackson. She spent three decades as a Girl Scouts um, troop leader. So the question, and I think you answered, is like, what advice would you give today to young Black girls who are interested in working at NASA? Um, and what do you think about their their work in Hidden Figures? I know um, you kind of answered. I don't know if there's anything else, Margot. I know Jim, you care a lot about STEM. You talk a lot about things for students. Um, you know. I love answers from from all of you on how do we engage this young generation? How do we in, especially include more um, young black girls, boys, minority children to the make so they're the future of NASA and they re re really represent what Mary W. Jackson, Jackson stood for. Well, I, I think that's one of the reasons why you know NASA made the bet on on the movie. You know, because we we expended a fair amount of resources on. Um, you know, uh, helping out with research in the movie, and then you know, um, doing other so, you know events associated with the movie, um, because we wanted to build that workforce we need to get us to the moon and Mars. Right? You know, they're they're not going to appear out of nowhere, and in this in this story, uh, really speaks to I think uh, people who in all kinds of circumstances that, that you can overcome. You know, difficult barriers. Yet it's not going to be easy necessarily, but there are you know you can you, if you. Focus on the energy, your energy into into doing it. You, know, you do the things you need to do to prepare yourself. You can you, know, you can be a part of this team and and make a difference and make the world a better place, uh, and also get us to the moon and Mars. Um, and so um, I think it was a it was a pretty good bet on our part to try and build our future workforce by doing this, as well as the you know, familiarize everybody with the, the past so that you know it not only inspires kids but it also inspires us adults that that we would see that message. Um, out there, and, and that you know, um, you know, we can all make the world a better place, but we got to stay focused on on the important values of our of our lives and, and build the culture we need to 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 build a uh, workforce that uh, that'll work together well and does that sort of Star Trek mentality thing of, of getting us ahead in the in the world and and, and bring us to a, a future that we all are looking forward to. I, I think that's I think that's right, Bill. And um, I would just say one of the things we need to do at NASA every day. Um, is build a workforce um, that um, is open, that is welcoming, that is inclusive and diverse, and let people know that NASA is a very safe place to come and work and do extraordinary things. As Bill said, it's not easy. Uh, what we do at NASA is very difficult, and, and we see that over and over in, in, in history. Uh, but at the same time, um, there, there are barriers, but those barriers cannot be based on any kind of discrimination, based on any kind of, and when I say discrimination, I'm talking about any kind of discrimination, racial discrimination. Uh, we have to eliminate those kind of obstacles so that somebody, if there is a, a young African-American child that says, man, one day I want to be one of those astronauts, that they don't feel like maybe they shouldn't. Uh, they feel like, in fact, they should. Um, and I think we as an agency, um, and we, we do a good job, make no mistake, but we can do more um, to make sure that everybody feels included and everybody feels like when they join NASA, they're going to have opportunities to excel and be promoted and all of those kind of things. And, you know, I, I would just uh, I would just piggyback on what the administrator said. And, you know, the thing about the thing about NASA and the thing about NASA's missions and the thing about, you know, uh, you know, when when President Kennedy decided that NASA and the America was going to go to the moon, he said, you know, we choose to do these things not because they're easy, but because they are hard, you know, and, and that is something that I think we really have to remember and say to these kids, you know, the reason why you're doing this and the reason why it means so much and why it is so meaningful and enjoyable isn't because it's easy. It's because it's hard. You know, that is a part of it. And if it's hard, that's okay. That is that is a part of it. You know, you look at what Mary Jackson did, Mary W. Jackson, look at what Katherine Johnson did, 
Look at what all those engineers and scientists and mathematicians did over the years. And you can do it too. It was hard for them too. You know, this, this is not easy work. This is challenging work. Um, but you are up to the task. It will be hard, but that's a part of it. And it is so rewarding. It's beautiful work. It's interesting work. Um, and so I think that, you know, that to me, um, that was always a part of the ethos of NASA that I loved so much. And my father kind of gave that to, to me and my siblings and, you know, Christine Dard and all these people. It was a very disciplined approach to that work. You didn't, you didn't get up from the table until after the last calculus problem was done, but there were rewards for that. And um, I think that teaching the kids that from a very early age probably means that, you know, 20 years from now, there's, there's an entirely new pipeline of engineers ready to carry out NASA's next mission. There's so many questions I want to ask, <laughs> but I know that we're, we're, we're trying to wrap up. Um, but, you know, I think there's a lot of people who are really proud of everything that is going on, but also want to continue to rep, um, represent and recognize the work of Hidden Figures. What are we doing as an agency um, or what can we do as society to make sure that we know more um, about hidden figures, recognize them, and also recognize other hidden figures that maybe weren't included in this book? So um, any thoughts from, from any of you? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so the, the agency, as, as you mentioned, um, we, want, we want to be inclusive. We want people from all over the nation, different backgrounds, different ethnicities to join us in this bold vision of going to the moon and, and on to Mars. And if, if we do it right, we will inspire the next generation to go into the STEM fields and our country and in fact humanity will, will in fact uh, be, be made better off. So those are the things that we work on. Just, you know, you asked um, what, what are we doing today? Um, you know, when, when we look at um, some of the recent events that we've seen, um, we, we've been taking action. And Bettina, you know this, day in and day out, we're looking at things that we can do uh, to make sure people do feel included. To, to start, though, I want to be clear, the, the amazing NASA workforce has, has really, it does a really amazing job. And, and because of that, um, you know, we're hopeful that the, the glass ceilings that were broken uh, by the hidden figures, whether it was Dorothy Vaughn or Mary W. Jackson, Katherine Johnson, Christine Darden, that, that, that those ceilings are no longer the barriers, um, but the barriers are only what it is you can achieve using, using your talents and your mind and, and, and all of us being able to work in an inclusive environment. So one of the first things we did um, when you know we started seeing these challenges from you know the the George Floyd incident, the police brutality, um, you know the the protests, um, the civil unrest. Uh, I asked our our um, office of chief of um, human capital, the the office of the chief human capital officer, if you will. Um, I asked her and um, our equal opportunity office to come together and look at all of the things that we do as an agency to bring people in. How do we recruit? How do we train? Um, how do we promote? And look at the things that we do, and, and it's just so everybody is aware, the, the NASA workforce does a great job. Um, you know, we, we have been you know, told over and over again um, by the Office of Personnel Management, they do a big workforce survey, and NASA is, is the number one agency in the federal government as far as uh, the best place to work. NASA has uh, the highest ratings on inclusiveness. So I, look, I want to be clear, NASA does an amazing job. But what we want to do is we want to always be striving for more. So what are the things that we're missing and how do we, how do, we do even better than we're doing? So I asked, I asked our, our organizations that are involved in these activities to, to report back to me on, on what we can do. Second thing, we did is um, I asked, we need to put together a strategic plan. And that strategic plan for the agency, of course, is longer term. But what that strategic plan includes is a lot of feedback from the workforce. So we're doing dialogues at the centers all across the agency to get what, what are the things that the workforce feels like we could do better from a diversity and inclusion perspective. 
so that we can actually put together actionable items um, for for this um, for this uh, for this time. The other thing, um, you know, that we did the, the the deputy NASA administrator Jim Moorhart and I, uh, we put together um, we put together a contract, if you will. Basically, uh, we signed a document that says that we are 100% committed to making NASA the absolute best place for diversity and inclusion, and that we will be free of discrimination and retaliation and any kind of harassment. And we've asked that all of our leaders, whether you're an associate administrator or a center director um, or another leader, we're asking all of our leaders to sign on to this so that we can absolutely see the commitment. So we're gonna be getting a lot of feedback in the coming months, um, and then we're gonna take actionable steps um, to improve the agency. Again, I wanna be clear, because I know how hard people work. Our agency is a great place to work, but we always wanna be striving to do more, and, and that's what we're doing. Um, so those are, those are just some of the things. We're, we're gonna get the feedback. We're gonna take the appropriate steps. Um, but it's also true, and I'll just make this announcement right here, Bettina. Um, you know, we have, we have our core values. You know, a lot of agencies and, and, and corporates have core values. Uh, I come from the Navy. When I was in the Navy, it was honor, courage, and commitment. Well, with NASA, we've got safety, teamwork, integrity, excellence. And within teamwork, which is a, an important core value, we had diversity and inclusion inside of teamwork. Um, but based on some of the conversations and dialogues that have been happening across the agency, we wanted to separate that out and make it, you know, an, an independent um, core value, which is inclusion. We're going to make inclusion an independent core value. So now there's five core values. Um, and, and, and yes, teamwork and inclusion, I mean, they go hand in hand. But I think it's important um, that what we do actually signals, you know, the, the things that need to be done to make NASA a better place. And so... You asked what we're doing. I know I just talked a lot, but um, obviously this is important to the agency. A lot of people doing great work and um, we wanna strive every day to, to be better, Bettina. And so those are the, the things that we're working on. That's fantastic, um, Jim. I think, you know, I think a lot of people would agree that, in, that one of the key tenants of Mary W. Jackson is inclusiveness. Is she is a, a, someone who dedicated her career to be incredibly inclusive. Um, and not to put you on the spot, Margo, but, you know, how do we, you know, the administrator just uh, outlined a bunch of stuff, uh, how we can continue to live in Mary W. Jackson's legacy, make it real on a day-to-day -day basis. What are your thoughts on this and how do we continue to live up to the standards set by Mary W. Jackson and, and these other, um, and these other incredible figures in NASA's history? I, I think that's a really good question. You know, one of the things that really struck me about Mary W. Jackson and, and her life and her career is that she never, she never felt that there was a difference that was so great that she could not bridge it with someone else. She always assumed that she had more in common with someone, even despite whatever the differences in background or gender or race or whatever. She always assumed that she was able to find some commonality. And then once she did that, to work together with that person, whether it was um, finding um, some kids that in, in the neighborhood and converting them to this, you know, uh, passion for engineering and science and, and, you know, finding that inside of them and connecting there or um, working with the people around her and getting them to say, hey, I'm going to reach back and, and bring these kids into the office and commit to mentoring them or tutoring them. You know, she was always trying to, to build the bridges so that everybody could then move in, in the same direction on whatever the mission was. And I think that's something that um, I think that is a, a, a wonderful core value and uh, something that, um, you know, when I think, OK, what what would Mary Jackson do here? What would she say about this situation? You know, she really was always trying to extend herself and to build those bridges and to find that common ground. And so I think that is something um, it's a core part of teamwork. It's a core part of inclusion. 
And um, it, it is one of Mary W. Jackson's fundamental values. That's so I, I would say remembering that is, is a good way to pave the way to the future. So thank you so much, everyone, for this wonderful conversation. We're going to wrap it up and I'm going to turn it over to the administrator for some closing remarks. Well, thank you, Bettina, for setting this up. And Margot Shutterly, thank you for your leadership and uh, taking what used to be hidden figures and, and making them now uh, no longer hidden. And for Bill Berry and all of the, the great work you've done at NASA as far as being a historian and, and helping tell these incredible stories of our, of our history. Um, I just want to thank everybody for this really amazing dialogue. And as an agency, um, as, as I said earlier, we're going to continue working um, to make this agency the most inclusive um, and diverse and value everybody's input and make it an agency that um, is free of any kind of discrimination, including racial discrimination, um, and an agency that, um, that is safer and better uh, because of the input of, of all of our great employees. And again, we're going to continue to work on how we bring in people in a more inclusive way, how we, how we grow them within the agency and promote them. Um, so there's, there's really a bright future here. And I want to be really clear, um, that future is embedded in the person of Mary W. Jackson. And this is why we named the headquarters after her. Uh, an amazing, not so longer hidden figure. Um, she now um, has the name of the NASA headquarters building. So uh, thank you, Bettina, and thank you to our panelists for being a part of this today.